BB with the bathwater. Among the motifs of cultural criticism, one of the most long established and central is that of the lie, that culture creates the illusion of a society worthy of man which does not exist, that it conceals the material conditions upon which all human works rise, and that comforting and lulling it serves to keep alive the bad economic determination of existence. This is the notion of culture as ideology, which appears at first sight common to both the bourgeois doctrine of violence and its adversary, both to Nietzsche and to Marx. But precisely this notion, like all expostulation about lies, has a suspicious tendency to become itself ideology. This can be seen on the private level. Inexorably, the thought of money and all its attendant conflicts extends into the most tender erotic, the most sublime spiritual relationships. With the logic of coherence and the pathos of truth, cultural criticism could therefore demand that relationships be entirely reduced to their material origin, ruthlessly and openly formed according to the interests of the participants. For meaning, as we know, is not independent of genesis, and it is easy to discern in everything that cloaks or mediates the material, the trace of insincerity, sentimentality, indeed precisely a concealed and doubly poisonous interest. But to act radically in accordance with this principle would be to extirpate with the false all that was true also, all that, however impotently, strives to escape the confines of universal practice, every chimerical anticipation of a nobler condition, and so to bring about directly the barbarism that culture is reproached with furthering indirectly. In the cultural critics after Nietzsche, this reversal of, of position has always been obvious. Spengler endorsed it enthusiastically, but Marxists are not proof against it either. Cured of the social democratic belief in cultural progress and confronted with growing barbarism, they are under constant temptation to advocate the latter in the interests of the objective tendency, and in an act of desperation to await salvation from their mortal enemy, who, as the antithesis, is supposed to is supposed in blind and mysterious fashion to help prepare the good end. Apart from this, emphasis on the material element as against the spirit as a lie gives rise to a kind of dubious affinity with that political economy which is subjected to an imminent criticism, comparable with the complicity between police and underworld. Since utopia was set aside and the unity of theory and practice demanded, we have become all too practical. Fear of the impotence of theory supplies a pretext for bowing to the almighty production process and so fully admitting the impotence of theory. Traits of malice are not alien even to authentic Marxist language, and today there is a growing resemblance between the business mentality and sober critical judgment, between vulgar materialism and the other kind, so that it is at times difficult properly to distinguish subject and object. To identify culture solely with lies is more fateful than ever, now that the former is really becoming totally absorbed by the latter and eagerly invites such identification in order to compromise every opposing thought. If material reality is called the world of exchange value and culture whatever refuses to accept the domination of that word or that world, then it is true that such refusal is illusory as long as the existent exists. Since, however, free and honest exchange is itself a lie, to deny it is at the same time to speak for truth. In fact, it a lie of the commodity world, even the lie that denounces it becomes a corrective. That culture so far has failed is no justification for furthering its failure. By strewing the store of good flour on the split beer like the girl in the fairy tale, people who belong together ought neither to keep silent about their material interests, nor to sink to their level but to assimilate them by reflection into their relationships and so surpass them.